Well, it is good to be uh, here together, and uh, this morning we will be wrapping up, uh, man, I'm kind of sad to be wrapping up the book of Titus. It's, uh, it's got a lot there for us, uh, but the Lord, uh, through his word, has a lot to say about what a healthy church is, and um, so turn in your Bibles, if you've got them, to uh, Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. This morning, I don't know if you've, uh, of course you have, you, you can maybe know the feeling of learning something new, right? If something's new to you and you're kind of breaking new ground or, or if you're starting a new job and uh, I was talking with my sister the other day and she said the learning curve is really steep. There's stress there, <laughs> right? If, if you're kind of uh, venturing into new territory, there can be stress. And... Uh, you know, I have a reputation. One of the ways I deal with stress, you can ask my parents, uh, or even if you asked my uh, supervisor when I was working at Good Life Fitness, uh, there, I have a reputation of, I just ask like a million questions, okay? I need to know why. I need to know not only what are we doing, but I need to know why, okay? And that kind of helped me um, quickly get past some of that stress of new things. We we come to Devon Park here, and while there might be uh, new ministries or new uh, initiatives, um, a lot has been established as far as, you know, doctrinally, what do we do, uh, what do we believe uh, theologically, and of course, we're not saying that, it, that this church is perfect, but we've had many generations here and we, at the church, we've had, and we do have a complete Remember, when Titus is, is going through this with Paul, uh, the Word of God had not yet be com been completed. So we have a complete Word of God to draw conclusions about how to do church. How does it work? What does it look like? And maybe you can identify the value of having someone older in your life or someone further along in something where they spend time instilling wisdom, guidance for you, right, preparing you for life's tasks. And, and this is no different with the Apostle Paul. His desire for Titus, it was something new at the time on the island of Crete. And Paul's desire for Titus is to lead a healthy church. Because I think we can all agree that God is a God of order, not chaos, right? God is a God of order. And so, Titus, you don't get to set up the church in Crete however you want. And if you have any doubt of the value of God being a God of order, uh, you can read through some of the Old Testament books like Leviticus. And you just ask yourselves as you're reading through verse after verse of specific things that need to happen to please the Lord, you can ask yourself if you think the Lord cares about the details. <laughs> There's no doubt. The book of Titus has reminded us that there are no spectators in a healthy church. Okay, let me repeat that. There are no spectators in a healthy church. The healthy church doesn't have a group of people that are kind of fans of what's going on and they can applaud others, but they themselves are not contributing. You will not find that here in the book of Titus. We are active. We are called, right? We, other parts of Scripture describe the Christian life as being a soldier for Christ. We're living stones in the church. And so the conclusion of this book, as we zoom out, because we've, we've really zoomed in, just a little bit of a review, we've really zoomed in on specific roles of different people in a healthy church, right? Starts with healthy leaders, and then, and then Paul instructs Titus with, with um, what do healthy older men in the church look like? And, and uh, by the way, I've been blessed to, to hang out with some of them recently, right? I was able to get over to, uh, to visit Gordon this, this past week, Gordon Saunders. Um, glad that he's home. And uh, he's just one of those guys that being around him is just an encouragement, right? I so value men like him, and we've got a number in this church. Older men with younger men, older ladies with younger ladies, right? Different demographics. Um, Titus even goes into uh, what God-honoring relationships look like with masters and bondservants. So there is something for everyone. 
that is to be a part of a healthy church as they follow the lead of healthy church leaders. And again, we as leaders, the directors and deacons, we covet your prayers um, in that sense. And so this morning, as we kind of zoom out and wrap up the book, we want to look at healthy churches being having healthy testimonies. Okay, and I don't just mean the church as a group of us, but healthy individual testimonies within that church. Now, a testimony is evidence in support of a fact or a statement. Okay, we realize here that we are in the world. Yes, we are in the world. And yet, very clearly, we are to live and our testimony is to show that we are not of it. That the children of God and the opponents of God are going to be polar opposites. And that's what our church should look like, completely countercultural. Our testimony is to be protected, okay, not only as a church, but again, individually protected, maintained, lived out, clearly with no confusion, where our actions match our words. And so maybe you've heard this question before. I'm sure you have. It says, if someone convicted you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to prove the accusation to be true? Would there be enough evidence in your life where, you would, where someone could say, yep, you're quote-unquote guilty of being a Christian? It's clear. And when we think of our testimonies, just because I like my brain works this way, so I did the math. Did you know that if you sit in church here for this hour, that 0.6% of your life in your week, or if you come on Wednesday nights or to Awana or something, if you're there for that hour too, then that's 1.2%. 1.2% of your life is lived within these walls. So what in the world happens with the other 98.8%? That, I would say, is where our testimony, really where the rubber meets the road. And I am not minimizing the importance of that 0.6 or 1.2%. Okay, we need to be together. We need to gather. That's clear. It's important. It's healthy. It's awesome. But the vast bulk of our time will be out there as a private citizen. And so our testimony, the evidence we show in support of uh, the fact of our lives being transformed by Christ, that's where it really matters. And so as we're going to see here in Titus 3, there are a few specific ways that we can measure and say, are our testimonies really effective in, in living, in glorifying the Lord, in pointing people to Christ? And so some people would ask, Pastor Rich, what does a healthy testimony look like? Well, thank you for asking. Let's get into it. Titus chapter 3, let's read the first 11 verses, okay? Remind them, Paul says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Yikes. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Let's just read that far and have a quick word of prayer here. 
Lord, we thank you once again that we have the complete word of God that we can read and chew on and study. We thank you for that, um, that gift that we have in our lives. We know there are many believers around the world that would love to have a copy of the word of God. So we thank you for it. We come to this time, Lord, and we ask that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes, would illumine our hearts, would, would teach us, and that all authority would come from your word. And that's why it deserves attention in our, in our lives. Not because of the human mouthpiece, but because of the message, the authority that comes from the living word of God, able to pierce to soul and spirit. It's alive. And so, Lord, help us to honor your word, not just by simply sitting and listening, but chewing on and doing your word in this important aspect of being a healthy church. We need your help, and we thank you that you provide it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the first thing about a healthy testimony of individuals in the church is that we see here in the first couple of verses that believers are going to be obedient to rulers. Okay? Obedient to rulers. I think we have that up on the screen there. We do not, if, if you're like me, we do not want to be satisfied alone if our church's health is measured only by operational organization. Okay? Now, uh, that is important. We have this annual business meeting coming up, and I was thinking about this. There's everything right with being organized, okay, striving together, in operational things, in tasks, in ministries, um, in, in all of those areas that are part of running a church. Okay, that's important. But that is not the ultimate. You could, you could be completely organized and have things really polished and be wasting your time at an unhealthy church. The measure of a healthy church is obedience to the Lord. Right? Right? And so if we're going to be obedient to the Lord, we're going to be obedient to rulers, as it says here in the first uh, couple of verses. It says, remind them. Okay, so I ask ourselves, as Devon Park members and, and attenders, are we a church that lives peaceably whenever possible with those who God has ordained to rule and govern? And I ask you that question even when we say even unsaved rulers? Yep. Even rulers who at times show corruption or are completely opposite to what we believe would be God's agenda, are we peaceably living under their, under their authority? The standard is yes, absolutely. And so we need that reminder. Now that doesn't mean we just go you know, mindlessly along with, with things that are anti-biblical. Of course we draw our boundaries but whenever possible, we are obedient to rulers. And he says, remind them. Who is them? Who is being reminded? All Christians. Okay, doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter if you're a church leader. Doesn't matter at this time of it being written. If you're a bond servant or a master, who needs reminders? All Christians. I don't know about you, but there's been some times that I need to be reminded of certain things about my testimony. All right, that's normal and it's healthy. So don't tune out because this is something we all need. Titus, the Christians there in Crete have a duty to do something out there. Okay, for the sake of a healthy testimony in that 98.8% of life, be subject, obey rulers and authorities. Now that is tough. Okay, and we're not going to get into politics because we have different political persuasions. But listen, no matter who is in power, you're going to have people and decisions made that as a Christian are going to make you cringe. Ugh, right? It's just difficult. Maybe it's frustrating. There's always going to be those things because, like us, those in authority are flawed and make mistakes. Okay, but be subject to those rulers. You will not find a statement here that says only if you like their policies. It doesn't matter how you feel about that government. Now, why is this so important? Because when this was being written, Cretan Christians, okay, let's remember, they're going to be kind of looked at suspiciously by the rest of the Roman Empire. Okay, they live different lives. They're kind of weird. Hopefully... Hopefully their lives are looking bizarre, right? 
Christian life should not make sense to the unsaved world. And if it does, there's something wrong there. Okay, so hopefully they're a little peculiar. In fact, Scripture uses that word to describe Christians in other parts of Scripture. We're peculiar, right? And, and so these people in Crete, they would have met for private worship. They're kind of doing their own thing. So yeah, yeah, maybe people look at Christians a little, you know, they're a little shady. They're a little sketchy. And there's a, a cross-reference here um, in 1 Peter 4. Um, you don't have to turn there, but if you read 1 Peter 4, the first little part of that chapter explains why Christians were looked at kind of cockeyed. Hmm. And the human reaction then would be the same as now when people do not understand something, then they have a hard time trusting it. And they might be a little bit nervous if they don't understand something. And so Christians had to be reminded that part of a healthy testimony is to be obedient, to be submissive to human government. Now, disclaimer here. In my past, you know those, you know, if you're on Facebook, you have those little memories that pop up once a year or so, right? And uh, this is the grace of God at work in my life. I'm not tooting my own horn, but 10 years ago when I was in, in pastoral ministry, I, these memories pop up on my, in, in Facebook, and I'm, I'm kind of reading some of the things that I posted. And I'm ashamed to say that I don't think some of that pleased the Lord. Why? Because it was untrue? No, no, it was very truthful. But there was not a hint of grace or love in my words. Okay? So if someone looked at my life, would they see a believer that was like submissive and supporting whenever possible the authority that was over me? I don't think so. And I, I know that displeases the Lord. Now, I'm going to be honest, and I'm not just talking about Devin Park here. I think this is, as I, as I view Christians posting on social media, some of it I look at, and they're mocking our leaders and calling them names, and I'm just thinking, man, this does not please the Lord. And I'm not, I'm not judging, because remember, I put myself in that category as, you know, you see this phrase in Scripture, and we're going to see it later in the chapter, such were some of you. Like, I was there. Okay, so I'm not saying, oh, how dare you. I'm saying, look, I used to be like that, but when God gripped my heart, I looked at what I was putting out there, and it, it did not even look like a, a, a Christian with a healthy testimony in relation to government. Please be discerning what you're putting out there. Because it's not just you that reads it. There are all kinds of people that are just looking for something to say. Ha, see, that Christian isn't different at all. They're not living out their faith. What a bunch of hypocrites. I want nothing to do with it. We don't need to give the unsaved world more excuses to not want to live for Christ. A healthy testimony is one of the keys to say, look, our lives are different. This kind of behavior with, our, with the government... If we're doing that, we are not ready, in verse 1, for every good work. So I was there, but, but because of the grace of God and the Spirit of God, if that's where you are, change, mature, grow, be different. The Word of God and the Spirit of God is everything you need to continually be molded and shaped to be more like Christ, even in the area of what we post online. Political division existed back in Crete too. Now, they weren't tweeting or Facebooking about it, but there were factions. There was rebellion against lawful authority. There were coups. And so Paul says to Titus, look, none of this is to have even a hint of who you are as Christians who are peaceable and gentle to those ruling over them. Whatever promotes peace and good order, whatever is your civil responsibility, do those things. Do those good deeds. Even if politicians make my life hard, yes. Even if they want to support, suppress the gospel and the name of Jesus Christ, yes. Now please don't misunderstand on this topic of our, our area of testimonies. I don't think you'll see Paul telling Titus, and I, I'm certainly not telling you that we should never call out the ills, the moral ills and decay 
of society. Yes, but I encourage you not to linger on cursing the darkness. If you went to a doctor and they say, I'm sorry, and this is, this is a hard concept for some because this has been reality for some of us. If you went to a doctor and, and you were with them for half an hour and all of those 30 minutes they were simply telling you the problem, and they went into details, let's say you've been diagnosed with cancer, and they go into all of the re's, all of the things that are going wrong in your body and all of the challenges that that's going to present, everything wrong, everything negative, and then you leave that consult, like at some point... A normal person is going to ask, okay, we get it, it's bad, but what do we do about it? Right? What's the plan? How do we treat this? What's the solution? And in the spiritual life, it's the same thing. Yes, please, right? We, we stand up for what is right. We call out wrong where it is, but get to the solution. If all we're leaving people with is what is wrong with society and we're just cursing the darkness, like at some point, light the candle of the gospel. Right? Man, I'm excited this morning. This is the, I I love this part, part of scripture. So submit to your rulers. Secondly, what's part of a healthy testimony? It's not just going to be about our rulers in verse two. Again, it zooms out to all people to speak evil of no one to be peaceable, to be gentle, showing all humility to all men. Okay, so we see these words here like no one, all. It's, it's complete. We see this word using th- that says gentle. The word used here means moderate, sweet, reasonableness. Okay? Moderable, sweet, reasonableness. Is this you? Is this me? That's what we should be. You know, I'm not always that way, not to, not to some. But let's, let's be honest, isn't it really easy with some people to be moderate, you know, sweet and reasonable? Yeah, because you're going to gravitate towards certain types of personalities. There's nothing wrong with that. Dare I even say in the local church family, just like the Cretan uh, Christians, that there's going to be some people where, hey, you just kind of jive with, Right? It's easy to show moderate, sweet reasonableness to those people. There's no faith involved there. That's that's easy. What about the people, dare I say, even in the church, but certainly out in the community? I call them kind of cheese grater people. Right? they They just rub you the wrong way. Be gentle with those people too? Absolutely. I'll give you a real practical example. When I started in ministry here, (laughs) um, I I made a meathead decision, okay? And some of you ladies can remember this. You were around for this. I I was kind of addressing some of the areas of the ladies' ministry early on in my time in this this church. And so I made a meathead decision to kind of change something out of the blue. I didn't get a lot of counsel. I didn't really have understanding of kind of the things that were going well that don't need to be reinvented. But I had this idea. I was like, we're going to change this. And all of those ladies, I was a cheese grater to some of those ladies. Okay? Believe it or not, yeah, I can rub people the wrong way sometimes. And I do stupid things sometimes. Can I, can I tell you, I am so glad to tell you that all of those ladies now are peaceable and gentle to me, and I thank them for their forgiveness. I can be a cheese grater to other. I don't want to be, but it happens sometimes. It does not require any effective testimony to be gentle with those who you already get along with. And it's not just in the church, right? You think of um, friends, co-workers, superiors. Are we gentle and peaceable with them even when they are maybe thinking the opposite as as we do or even if we don't get our way? So we are gentle. That's part of a healthy testimony. We are humble. Showing It says showing all humility to all men. This is key. Our humility. Can I tell you that uh, that our adversary, uh, Satan, hates humility? Okay? We want to be humble because if we're honest, if we look at our own lives... We have every reason in the world for our testimony to be of humility when we think about, and we're going to get into the gospel, the gospel heavy heavy center uh, 
section rather of, of verse 3 to 7. We have every reason to be humble. Uh, in Proverbs 29, it says, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Later on in the New Testament, Paul talks to the Corinthian church and he says, And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. So it's not of ourselves. We had an excellent reminder last week, Pastor Terry tackled a great topic in Romans, that our salvation is not about us. It's not, what about, it's not about what we bring to the table. We bring sin to the table. That's what we bring. That's a cause for humility when we think about being saved. It's about God bringing life to a spiritually dead person by his spirit for his glory. Okay, so no, no boasting allowed. Let's turn over real quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And a lot of us, you know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, well, we just need to, uh, you know, reflect and be like the New Testament church. Well, yeah, there's a lot of good things that they did, but uh, it was still made up of flawed people. Okay, they certainly uh, weren't perfect. Let's remember that. They had some major problems too. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 8, Paul says, No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren. There's some problems going on. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor reviles, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and listen to this. It's like, oh, what a, what a horrible list of people. I'm so glad that we're, you know, we're not like that. And then he says, and such were some of you. The church is new, right? And so a lot of transformation stories of the gospel, like these might have been some people that were living like this like a few weeks ago. Such were some of you. But you were washed. Okay, so all of that, it described you, but you were washed. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You're called out from that life. Nothing about that says boasting. It says we're trophies of God's grace and his mercy. No boasting allowed. You know, first, you don't have to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 5, sexual immorality. Acts 5, verses 1 to 11. The whole Ananias and Sapphira thing where they're lying and they get zapped, they're dead on the spot. Yeah, that's a problem. And such were some of you. Now, aren't you glad this morning that we don't have to stop with guilt, that we can continue to grace and in grace because of that but? Aren't you thankful for the, for the Lord in the rest of that verse when it says, but you were washed? I'm thankful for that. And so this is the reason for humility, because every, every single one of us here, apart from the grace of God, apart from his washing, apart from his regener regeneration, what are we? Well, we're wretches. <laughs> we're, uh, we're hopeless, right? Our, our hearts, left to our own devices, desperately wicked. And so an effective testimony, not only in church, but in that 98.8% of our lives, is a humble testimony because of who we are before. We remember who we are before Christ. We remember who we would be without Christ. Now listen, I'm not suggesting that we dwell and we get really discouraged thinking about all our past sin. I think there's some danger there if we dwell on, on that. But if you're ever struggling to relate to someone who is currently living in sin or currently returning to bad, destructive habits and they don't know the Lord, if you're ever having a hard time relating to someone like that, just remember what God saved you from. Because it, I think if we're honest, we can describe ourselves here. Is anyone here foolish on their own? Oh, yeah. Is anyone disobedient? Definitely. Who were we before Christ? Completely in the dark. We were completely deceived. We were completely spiritually blind. We were completely spiritually dead, Ephesians 2 verse 1 says. 
And that's why with that truth in mind, when we remember who we were, but then we praise God for who we are in Christ, that's why I firmly believe that the gospel power isn't just something to be celebrated once. It isn't just to be remembered once a month at communion. But the power of the gospel, where our hope comes from and our sufficiency, that is a reminder that I believe is needed every day of life. Why? Because our pride needs to be killed every day of life. It is stubborn. My pride is stubborn. And we said earlier, Satan loves that pride. He loves proud people in church. And he hates humble people in church. You want to know why? Because humble people are moldable and teachable. All right? If Satan can't take away our salvation, and he can't, then the next best thing he can do is render us useless in the Christian life. Pride is an excellent way to do that. Just this this week, and again, this is why I'm excited about this, because I was studying this. When you study the Word of God, and then you've got like conversations literally within 24 to 48 hours of what you're reading, it's awesome, right? You're like, wow, this is, this is how these conversations are supposed to go. I was talking with someone this week where we, we were discussing something, but then... Uh, they came to say, they came to realize, like, wow, I, I really need to change. And there is much rejoicing when you see that humility and you say, that's someone that the Lord's working in. That person is growing. Man, that's exciting. Where we say, Lord, help, help me, Be, teach me, change me. We need the gospel power every day. So an effective testimony with others is gentle, it's humble. And verse 3, it says it's gracious. Testimony interaction with others should be undeniably and consistently gracious because of you know, what we remember uh, the grace of God has done in our lives. Maybe you're saved. Maybe you came to know the Lord early in life. Right? I was saved when I was four years old. And maybe you think, well, my testimony, right, I don't, I don't have any of those dramatic, you know, formerly, I, you know, I, I, wasn't li- I wasn't parting it up at four years old, right? I'm not out there living the prodigal son kind of lifestyle. That's kind of boring, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely not. You can thank the Lord that he saved you from those things. Your testimony isn't boring. It never is. Whatever situation the Lord used to save you, you can tell that exact story to someone else that only you, maybe the Lord has put people in your path where your past is going to connect with them really well in a way that mine wouldn't. So if you're saved early in life, boldly proclaim that testimony about God's goodness early on in your life. If you were saved later in life and you were saved out of some of those things, amazing. Now go find other people that are later in life that are still in bondage. There's not a single testimony that God cannot use and you are the only voice that is going to tell it. That's up to you. And so it is gracious As we interact with other people, gentle, listen to these words, gentle, humble, uh, gracious. And and fourthly, when we deal with others, it is gospel pointing. We already read that, right? For we ourselves were once this way. And then by by the end of verse 7, it says, "But but we're completely different. We've been justified. We're heirs of God. This is a complete turnaround from foolish and disobedient living. This is a complete turnaround from when we used to be enemies of God with his wrath abiding on our heads to justified heirs of eternal life. It's the power of God through Jesus Christ. That's exciting. Washing, salvation, renewal, mercy, regeneration, justification, errors. God's love is, is like double amazing, Okay. Think about this. It is one thing, and even if this was just by itself, this alone would be completely mind-blowing. If God's love, if if his mercy, if the only thing that God did for you was remove the debt of sin and punishment, if the only thing that he took away was hell, 
That in itself is unbelievable. Okay? But that's not all that salvation is. Okay? It's not only the mercy of God which spares us from that which we deserve and the punishment, but the second part of God's love, the second part of the gospel is equally amazing. It's not just removing the bad, it's what salvation gives us. It's not just taking something away, it's what is in its place. It is eternal life. It's one thing to say to, for, for the Lord to say to us, okay, you're no longer objects of my wrath. It's another thing to say, welcome to the family. Holy. And to say that to sinners who have nothing to offer you who are your enemies, amazing. We are completely forever made sons and daughters of God. This means hope. And the world is in short supply of hope. The 98.8% of the time that we're out there, our testimony should bring hope. We see here in verse 8, there's a doctrinal reminder of, uh, you know, it's not, it's not only one thing to be reminded of doctrine, but that, re- that leads to duty. So what do we do with this? Right? It says in verse 8, uh, I want you to, be, uh, to affirm constantly that those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works. Okay, that's the, that's the duty. And I, I don't mean just in duty where you go around moping around saying, oh, well, this living for God is something I have to do. But it is a duty. It's our responsibility. You can still choose to have joy in the duties that you do. Right? You're completely free to make that decision for a duty to be something that you delight in. Ooh. Doctrine, duty, delight. Sounds like some other time. Okay, so thirdly, okay, so we talked about an effective testimony in, in um, relation to our rulers, in relation to one another. Now, verse 9, um, this is kind of where we want to end off here. Verse 9, avoid, avoid. Okay, this is tough to think about, but sometimes a healthy testimony is going to involve steering clear or separating from some types of people. That is not a comfortable thought. How intolerant, right? What if we offend someone? But that's what it says here, and it's true, right? It is very common, Paul says, what's going on here, there's certain people who love to rile things up to be an issue. And some people, and I'll put myself in this, if I'm if I'm wanting to find an issue with something, I can. Right? Sometimes there's nothing there, and we can make something out of nothing, stir up stink in the church or in our community. And a healthy testimony is going to remove, like, distance themselves from these kinds of people. It's going to, if you're taking notes, we, you know, the government, and then we talked about others, and here's the third part, of the major part of a, an effective testimony. It's going to avoid division. The kind of people that want to fight about non-issues, okay, they're just oppositional. They promote self and their opinion over unity in the Scripture. Now, take this with a grain of salt, but I believe that one of the people, types of people that Paul is talking about, doesn't come out and name them, but I believe that these are Judaizers in the church. It doesn't explicitly say, but you think about in some of the early church and some of the, the culture, who likes to muddy the waters about salvation? Who is it that tends to dispute endlessly about the law? Who are the influences in the early church that have had a hard time accepting that the gospel is faith alone and Christ alone, right? They're having a hard time getting past that and that salvation is not of works. Who does Paul rebuke in other other epistles to other churches and young leaders? It's Judaizers. Those who want to add to what is required for someone to be saved those who would say, you need to adhere to the Mosaic law to be saved. And th- those types of people today are still very prevalent, even in the church. Today, there are lots of hypotheticals. There are lots of useless, fruitless arguments meant to stir up division. Have you ever heard questions like this? How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? 
Can God make a stone so big that he is unable to, to move it? Who cares? Like, that's useless. Get it out of here. Okay? Um, it, another, another verse from Proverbs, chapter, chapter 20, it says, It's honorable for a man to stop striving. I love Proverbs. It says, Any fool can start a quarrel. That takes no skill. It takes discipline and it takes spiritual maturity to say, I don't want anything to do with that. Listen, this is being written in the time of Greco-Roman culture. They loved the public oratory. They loved to wax eloquent in their debates. Uh, in their debates. Ah, it's all, it's all pomp and, and intellectualism. And, and uh, some of those people would be in churches. And their testimony is to be different from these types of people that love to puff themselves up. And, and deal with hypotheticals and try to muddy the waters doctrinally. 2 Timothy 2, uh, you can, it's up on the screen there. This is strong wording. It says, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. You think that these profane and idle babblings are just going to be idle? No, they're going to grow. All right? It's, things are just going to get worse if they're not corrected. And their message will spread. Ugh, this is gross. Like cancer. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Second Timothy, also here in Titus. You think Paul is trying to drill something in about this useless talk? Now, I love the context. Let's not divorce this from the previous verses. I love the context of these previous verses. Verse 3 to 8 you know, that's what we are, it says, this is a faithful saying, and these things, so the things that he just mentioned, verse 3 to 7, all of that great stuff, the primary doctrine, the things that we say, hallelujah, all of those things, those things are to be affirmed constantly. The gospel, hope, salvation by faith alone, those things are profitable to all men. Make much of primary things. Keep the main thing the main thing. All of those things that he just listed, like talk about those things. Because they edify, they build up, they draw together. Focus on those things. I don't know if you've ever been uh, trapped in a conversation that isn't useful. <laughs> um, it's happened. and I'm, I've been a pastor for... 12 and a half years now, and, uh, you know, I love talking with people at the door. Uh, once in a while, as two or three people walk by that could use encouragement or, or need a good word, I, yeah, there's sometimes that the, it's just a, a useless conversation that you're stuck in with someone. Just doesn't, doesn't produce anything, doesn't help anything. And how, it, you know, how are we supposed to minister to all um, as a servant of the Lord? How am I supposed to help all if one person wants to talk about useless fluff? Now, not all genealogies are bad. And the word striving is not inherently bad. Some things are worth striving for. And there can be good use of genealogies. For instance... It's a fascinating study if you look through the genealogies and you study through the generations all about the bloodline of Christ. That's interesting, right? That's genealogy. There's nothing... Genealogies are, are neutral. But people are people then and still now, and sometimes much knowledge, if we're studying, if we're amassing all of this knowledge, sometimes that can easily lead, lead to being puffed up where we want people to know what we know. We want them to know how much we know. Like we're the smartest person in the room. That, that doesn't please the Lord in our testimonies. And that's not a pleasant thought in the local church, but it's a reality. And, and so 
That's why Paul has to remind Titus, hey, if you're dealing with these kinds of people, it says avoid, but look at this. Verse 10, if that doesn't work, reject. Ooh. It's a more forceful need. If avoiding is not enough, if there has been multiple rejections, there is a process for people who are consistently sinning and disrupting the peace and teaching false doctrines and spreading them to others. Healthy believers that make up a healthy church must maintain the purity of the church by rejecting those to seek to, to corrupt it. And this is not just a call for believers and saying, you're able to do this as a healthy church. It's stronger than that. It says you must do this as a healthy church. Now, this doesn't mean that you're hasty and that, you know, at the slightest inconvenience, you know, out the door, get out of here. All options are to be exercised first. In Matthew 18, there's some specific steps of confronting problems and and if people are really riling things up, but you'll notice even in all that process and of, of correction, what is the goal? It's never to um, reject or to cast out. It is always to reconcile. Okay? That's always the goal. But if this person in Titus 3 is, is not going to listen to an admonition, then let's be real. You're not really throwing, themselves out, uh, throwing them out of the church. They've basically thrown themselves out of the church. And that's why it says they're self-condemned. Like this is something they brought on themselves. Strange way to think about healthy testimony, but let's think about this. And again, I don't use this analogy lightly, but it's a powerful one. Okay, I'm not making light of cancer. But let's say that you heard that you had cancer. It's a powerful image that Paul uses that we just read from those verses in 2 Timothy 2. Let's say it's some physical cancer. You think you're just going to kind of let that hang around and be like, ah, okay, Sarah, Sarah. Or do you think that you're going to want to do, about it, do something about it for the sake of the rest of the body's health? You're not going to sit on that. You're not going to be passive about that. You want to get rid of that cancer before the cancerous influence spreads. And a healthy church testimony demands that we distance, avoid, and even reject unhealthy things going on in the church. That's part of a healthy testimony. So let's wrap it up. A healthy church is a healthy testimony. A healthy testimony is obedient to rulers... A healthy testimony interacts with all of the people in the community in certain ways that we looked at. A healthy testimony avoids and rejects division and the dividers. And last, real quick, in verse 14, it maintains good works. And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs, urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. The goal of a healthy church is for us to be a fruitful church. I mean, who would want to live an unfruitful life? No one sets out to do that, but it happens when we don't take care of our testimonies. We want to meet urgent needs. I tell you, one of the blessings I have, I love seeing when, when our benevolent committee is giving of their time and their energy and sometimes their finances to, to meet urgent needs, to serve others. That's exciting. And so where do we live 98.8% of our lives? Not in church. It's the community. And maintaining good works is not a way of attaining salvation, of course. Maintaining good works, Paul says, is an effective witnessing tool to the community. And that theme is all throughout this book. Chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Chapter 2, verses 5, 8, 10, 12, 14. Maintain good works. Healthy church. Now, we want to close with this. If I describe you, if you're a member or a regular attender here, and this description fits you, I want you to simply stand up when I describe you, okay? A healthy church has healthy leaders. If you are a leader in any ministry from our children right up to our deacons and directors, if you are a leader in this church, can you stand up for me? Okay? Any type of leadership position, deacons, directors, ministries of any kind, you can stand up. If you are, and there's no age limit on this, if you are an older man, 
okay? Let's say, so I don't offend anyone, let's say you're over the age of 80. If you're over the age of 80 and you're a man, stand up. Okay, no shame. If you are a man who is younger than 80, please stand up. If you're a man here and you're younger than 80, okay? If you are a lady who is over 80 years old, please stand up. Okay? If you are a lady here who is younger than 80 years old, please stand up. Any lady here younger than 80, okay? Now, I'm not going to expect too many people to stand for this one if you're a master who has bond servants. Okay. Look around, okay? This, if you look around right now, this is what a healthy church looks like. All of you is what it takes to have a healthy church church. All right, let's remain standing for prayer. Lord, thank you. I want to thank you that you give ways of us serving one another and being actively part of a healthy church. I pray, Lord, that we would never defer serving you, looking for ways to bless others, intergenerational ministry, children's ministry. We pray for our leaders here, all of these people groups, all of these demographics are needed for us to be a healthy church at Devon Park. And so, Lord, I pray that we would not just look to the left and to the right and say, well, what are other people going to do? All of us, Lord, are needed to have healthy testimonies here, healthy testimonies in the community. Lord, I would ask that you would give us wisdom to be humble as we think about what we've been saved from, but to be confident and bold as we share the truth and love with others because we are not what we formerly were. We thank you for saving us. You've saved us for a purpose. It's not to go to heaven right away. There's work to be done. And we want to let the doctrinal truths that we have studied to now flow into delightful duty. We all have a part, Lord. We never spiritually retire. Use us powerfully, we pray. Help us to guard our testimonies. And when we need to be reminded of our testimonies, like we read about, may the reminder be gracious, and may the one being reminded be humble. Please, Lord, do not let us individually let pride in our lives create wedges and cracks of opportunity for the enemy. Spirit of God, help us to be truly a healthy church. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.